Hey everyone. Out in the field right now, just wrapping up at the Naka Valley Refugee Settlement, one of the largest refugee settlements in the world. And here with my good friend, Savangale, we've spent uh, some time here meeting with people, meeting with amazing people. Yeah. Um, what's one of the takeaways? What's something that you've really, I don't know, felt while we've been in the field together? My goodness. <laughs> my time here has been incredible. It has been absolutely amazing. And I think the fact that there are people from more than 10 different nations here, but you know, no matter their religion, no matter which country they come from, they're able to live together peacefully and come up with ways to better the communities and work together, I think is incredible. And that's a lesson for all of Africa. It's a lesson for the whole world, really, that our differences, they don't matter. Yeah. And that we can actually come together and do some good for ourselves and other people. It's, it's one of the best examples of peace building, I think, mm -hmm. I've, that I've seen. And they work yeah. at it so hard. Exactly. They have to because there's so much difference, but so much commonality mm -hmm. in this space protecting each other. Exactly. And I think the, um, the resilience of the people, yeah. you know, refugees are not just refugees. Yeah. They have whole lives before they got here. They have whole lives while they're here exactly. as well. And being able to tap into who they are, their strengths, helping each other with other people's weaknesses and coming together and being able to build from that is, is a very important lesson for all of us. I think that wherever you've come from, whatever the challenges have been, you can overcome that. Yeah. yeah. It's a powerful story. It is. I'm glad we got to share it. Thank you so oh. much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to the Rotary Club meeting for March 22nd, 2023. I'm your president. That was a brief uh, insight into what the Rotary International President is doing in Africa. Um, I am very pleased to say that she's had a great year with her theme, Imagine Rotary, uh, Rotary. And of course, we've also had the same thing as we work here in our club, all the different things we have going on. So I let, uh, I've introduced myself, the other person that is with us right now. Everyone is not piled in, but we're, we're keeping on time. Uh, Mary Ann, introduce yourself. I'm Marianne Kistler. I've been a member of how many years? I forgot. <laughs> over, over 30, Marianne. Oh, over 30 is correct. Yes. Oh, that's right. I'm the current foundation chair. And um, I just really, really love what Rotary does. And you and I had a great trip out to uh, Rancho Mirage, where we went out with the uh, Armed Services YMCA and celebrated their 30th anniversary. That was an excellent trip. Um, and we had a very good time out there. Yes, we did. So let's see, our guest today is Wen Chen. Wen was born in China at the end of the Great Cultural Revolution, being the victim of this horrific atrocity that killed two million intellectuals and destroyed traditional Chinese culture. Wen's parents had mixed feelings about her education. Despite their discouragement, Wen eventually won a national prize at a science competition when she was 16. Hence, she went to a top university for undergraduate study, and then came to the U.S. in 1994 for graduate school. Uh, Wynn received a Ph.D. in biology at the California Institute of Technology in 2000. Because of her personal experience of being brainwashed in China, she decided to, voice for, to be a voice for the voiceless. Since 2012, she has given hundreds of presentations to community organizations about Chinese culture, history, and society. Wen has, worked, has been working for Caltech since 2000 as a biologist and information scientist. Her everyday work includes scientific outreach by speaking at conferences and seminars at universities. In her personal life, she is an active member of the Amnesty International, focusing on human rights in China. She serves as a board member and community liaison for Caltech Women in Biology and Biolog Biological Inter Engineering. She has a blog. It's wenchenview.blogsot.com. Welcome to the Rotary Club of San Dimas, Wen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raymond, for getting me here. And so as it was mentioned in my bio that I have been a scientist all my life. And there was one incident really changed my view towards China. It was in 1995, when I was a first year graduate student at Caltech, and my American colleagues asked me about the Tiananmen massacre. And I just bluntly replied that there was no massacre. I said, the students were so bad, they killed the soldiers, because that's all I saw on Chinese TV. Uh, no, in 1990, in 1980, in 1989, say like the students killed the soldiers. We saw dead bodies of soldiers, and then my my American friends 
said, like, how could you deny the fact? Like, all over the world, media reported it. And, you know, they still showed me the videos and the pictures. And at the beginning, I saw, like, the, those were from Hollywood movies. So it took me years to awake from this propaganda. And I remember it was in 2000, I eventually realized that, okay, all my life, I've been brainwashed. And so for the rest of my life, I want to do something. Uh, I want to speak about human rights in China. So speaking about human rights in China, I'm sure you have been hearing uh, in the news all the time about how, you know, Uyghurs are persecuted, how, uh, you know, Tibetans, Christians are persecuted. But today I'm going to talk about one group that has been uh, considered by Amnesty and the United Nations as the largest Chinese group persecuted by the, the, the government. So it's called Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa. In Chinese, Falun means universe, Gong means energy, and Dafa means principle. So from the name, you can tell that it is a traditional Chinese meditation practice based on the principle, truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. These are all traditional Chinese value. Falun Gong has been famous for its health benefits, and it's always taught for free because according to its teachings, nobody should make profit from it. Because of these two reasons, this is one of the most popular um, meditation in the world. Over 100 million people in more than 114 countries practice Falun Gong. And in Southern California, we see Falun Gong in many community events like, you know, Independence Day Parade, at Earth Day, Health Festival, you see people demo the exercise, they teach newcomers the meditation. They also brought traditional Chinese performances to our neighborhood. And in China, before the government started the persecution, there used to be very, very popular uh, in China, like in almost every park in China, you see hundreds and thousands of people gathering together in the morning, practicing Falun Gong together for better health. In June 1999, the US News and World Report published an article said that China had 70 million people practicing Falun Gong. The article also said more people are joining Falun Gong than joining the Communist Party. And when I read that article, I felt very nervous. I thought, wow, this group is in trouble because Communist Party has been maintaining their authority with violence and propaganda. And propaganda is a very important part of their authority because they want to brainwash people uh, and eliminate their independent thinking. And in my parents' generation, the Communist Party thought any education can give people independent thinking. That's how they started the Great Cultural Revolution. They shut down the whole intellectual, the whole education system in China for 10 years and killed over 2 million intellectuals. And nowadays, the Chinese government also you know, suppress religious practice, like uh, they can control Christian church by, uh, you know, in China by teaching them like a communism in Christian churches. They can also use the same way to control Buddhist and uh, Taoist, but they cannot do that to Falun Gong. This, this is because Falun Gong is a personal practice. People can literally practice alone at home without being associated with any others. There's no church, no registration. And this make it very hard for the government to, to manipulate them. So in July 1999, just one month after that article was published, China started a massive persecution towards Falun Gong. The government threw uh, millions of people in, into prison because of this meditation. And over the past 24 years, we have seen thousands of death cases, but those are probably just tips of iceberg because of the information blockage. What is the most shocking to us to learn was in March 2006, a Chinese nurse came to Los Angeles and she held press conferences among Chinese media said her ex-husband was a military surgeon and he killed over 2,000 Falun Gong within three years and took corneas from them for transplant. That was so shocking that the reporters thought they must check whether it's true. And so the first thing they checked was the hospital website in China they immediately found something suspicious because in the United States, we are already the largest transplant country in the world. People usually wait for three years for kidney transplants. But in China, almost every hospital promised that they can find donors in a couple of weeks. And you may wonder, oh, it's a big nation. Maybe they have car accidents all the time, like, you know, find donors easily. But in reality, China does not even have a valid organ donation system.
And Chinese people really donate organs because for thousands of years, Chinese people believe in Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, and all the traditional beliefs uh, believe in reincarnation. So in Chinese culture, one must have the body together when they die and they have to cremate it and, uh, and bury it all together. So people do not donate organs, usually not even to their uh, friends and families. So according to Red Cross China, in the year of 2010, the whole nation, only um, 34 people donated their organs. But China performed about 100,000 transplants per year. If you look at the numbers published by their hospitals and medical journals. And where did they find all these donors? In the past 17 years, I have seen hundreds and thousands of witness reports from Chinese hospitals, patients, and like, you know, victim families. Also, I have saw, seen like hundreds of Falun Gong practitioners uh, reported to the uh, reporters in the U United States that when they were in detention, all Falun Gong practitioners had to go through systematic blood type tests and organ checkups every three to six months. They were never told the results. They also noticed that doctors were particularly interested in body parts that can be transplanted. Um, and also in 2006, Two Canadians did a third-party investigation. They recruited volunteers who can speak Mandarin, and they called 15 major hospitals in China, and they asked uh, uh, two questions. The first question, oh, if I go to China for a kidney transplant or heart transplant, how long do I need to wait? And the second question, uh, I heard there's a group called the Falun Gong. They don't smoke, they don't drink, and they're very healthy. Do you have any donors like that? According to the phone recording, almost every hospital responded that they can find the donors within 24 hours. You just need to come with cash. In 2006, you can download the price chart of body parts in, Ch in these Chinese hospitals, like $30,000 for pair cornea, all the way up to 150 k to a new heart. And several hospitals openly stated that their donors were Falun Gong, and they are male and under 40 years old, and they are alive. And one hospital, the doctor even said, we guarantee the quality, like we replace them for free. That was unbelievable, because these are doctors. And how can they kill innocent people without feeling guilty? But think about my personal experience as a ordinary high school student in China, I totally believed that there was no Tiananmen massacre. I believed that those students killed the soldiers. It's all because of the propaganda, and the propaganda was very, very successful. And in the same way, the Chinese government has been demonizing Falun Gong ever since the persecution started. So 24-7, all, every day, all Chinese people receive from their state media was that, oh, this group, they are terrorists. They kill themselves, they kill their babies, they kill neighbors, so we should report Falun Gong to the, to the authority and police should take them away and doctors should make some better use of their body parts. So when doctors killed Falun Gong practitioners, they do not kill, feel guilty. They saw like these were terrorists, they're bad people. It's very much like during the Holocaust, how everyday Germans, you know, the regular German citizens, like they sent Jewish neighbors to concentration camps and killed them without feeling guilty because of the propaganda. And this has been going on in China in the past 20 years. And there were quite a few books and documentaries about uh, organ harvesting in China. You can probably find them online. And according to this research, people believe that uh, in, before 2016, about 90% of the transplants probably target Falun Gong as the most wanted donors. And after 2016, Chinese government also started to target Uyghurs because Uyghurs, they are, uh, you know, Islamic. And like, you know, so they became the most popular quoted donors among Middle Eastern uh, patients because they want halal organs from body who have never ate pork. And nowadays, people believe that the Chinese government also started to target young students in high schools and the colleges because there have been many, many uh, cases of students when they disappeared and then the government refused to look for them. And we have heard all these sad news and several countries already took action, like Israel, 
uh, passed a law in 2008 that their insurance company would not cover any transplant expense if people go to countries like China for illegal transplants. And Spain regarded this as a criminal crime. Taiwan and Italy punish brokers who introduce patients to China for transplant. And actually, in the United States, uh, the only official action was in 2016, House Resolution 343, condemning the fourth organ harvesting in China. It was bipartisan, with many co-sponsors, and unanimous, unanimously uh, passed, but still, it's a non-binding resolution. And how come our reaction came so late and so weak, and one big element was that the Chinese authority had been putting actions, you know, to pressure, pressure our elected officials from speaking out. And we also have uh, two bills circulating in the Congress and the Senate this month at this moment, like, you know, they were introduced like just a month, less within the past one month. House, um, you know, the bill is called a Stop Organ Harvesting uh, uh, act. So it's a concurrent thing going on in the Congress and the Senate. Let's see, let's hope that they will be voted this year because in the past, the Chinese government always pressure our elected officials to prevent them from getting a vote on this resolution until the session of Congress expire. And they had done this in California. Over, uh, over 10 states in the US already passed a statewide resolution to prevent their patients from going to China for quick transplants. And California also tried to pass a resolution in 2017 condemning the organ harvesting in China and raise uh, public awareness of this crime in China. But before it was voted, um, the Chinese consulate in San Francisco sent an email to every Senate members and asking them to block that resolution. And Senate President Kevin DeLeon at that time blocked the resolution. And that was a shocking news at that time to me, like, uh, you know, how the Chinese consulate can just give orders to our elected officials about our local affairs. And you may think the Chinese propaganda far from us, but you have been reading them all the time without realizing it. Because China has been paying, the Chinese government paid over 30 mainstream newspapers worldwide to carry their newspaper insertions. And this is one example of the newspaper insertion on LA Times. That was uh, this particular issue is April 29, 2020. So on that particular date, LA Times had 38 pages. And 11 out of the 38 pages were called international daily. They are paid advertisement by the Chinese government. So all the contents came from the Chinese government. They highly praised the Chinese government during the pandemic, how wonderful they were in taking care of their people and how great the Communist Party is like in, as a system. So people read this in LA Times without paying attention to the very tiny font that these are, ten, these are paid advertisement. So day after day, people have this uh, you know, impression that Los Angeles said China did a great job in pandemic and Communist Party is a great system of ruling the world. And so like, you know, LA Times still carries the newspaper insertion. Uh, and we also just started to come back this kind of media infiltration by labeling some Chinese media as, as a foreign mission and ask them to disclose their financial status. So in April 2020, I can download, I was able to download a file from the website of the US Department of Justice about the business bound by China Daily, just one of these newspapers in China. So the document indicated that China Daily paid the New York Times for $4.6 million for this kind of newspaper insertion. And China Daily paid the Wall Street Journal $6 million. So you know, right after that the document went online, New York Times quietly removed several hundred articles from their website and promised that they would not do this kind of business again, which is good beginning. But unfortunately, you know, there are still quite a lot of uh, foreign media, Western media, including LA Times, continue to carry this kind of newspaper insertion to glorify uh, the Chinese government. And in the education system, Confucius Institute is a free Chinese language program operated by the Chinese government in over 100 universities and over 500 high schools in the United States. And in this free 
Chinese language programs, like basically, like you know, Chinese government send everything from textbook to teachers. Um, but Confucius Institute teaches the Communist Party's version of history. For example, in Confucius Institute, they taught that Americans started the Korean War because Americans wanted to invade North Korea and then invade China. And that was exactly what I learned as a student in China. But we are talking about Stanford and UCLA, all these top universities in the United States. When our students, when our children, grandchildren go to these universities, when they take history lesson, the universities let them take them in the local Confucius Institute. So this is, is like, you know, very uh, troublesome to many of our educators. And that was why like in 2020, the US uh, Department of State uh, required a Confucius Institute to register as a foreign mission. And they also stopped giving fundings to those Confucius Institutes, uh, those uh, universities running Confucius Institutes. For example, Stanford and UCLA have Confucius Institute. That means Stanford and UCLA can no longer get federal funding to support their Mandarin program. So they chose to get funding from China instead of US uh, you know, for their education. But many other universities, they chose to shut down their Confucius Institute. So uh, about 85% of Confucius Institute closed in the United States. But unfortunately, um, many of these universities, they started to establish relationship with other universities in China. So basically they continue to get teaching material, teaching uh, and teachers from China, uh, you know, to avoid the sanction by the US government. And so we have a long way to go to keep our academic freedom. And Hollywood have been for decades, they want to enter the Chinese market to sell their film there. And of course the Chinese government set a very high bar there because you have to censor your film uh, to get into the market. But the Chinese market is now the number one movie market in the world. So Hollywood has been making films to cater the need of the Chinese government. For example, in many big productions like the Marty and like Gravity, whenever the US astronauts got stuck in deep space, we always see the Chinese government come to rescue them. So the take home message from these big Hollywood productions that you know, communist party is our friend, they come to rescue us when we need them. And communism is a better system because they have better technology than us. So these, these infiltration into Hollywood, as a matter of fact, AMC theater and quite a few uh, entertainment dis industry, you know, they belonged, they were bought by a Chinese mother company for almost 10 years. And this influence for long term already made Hollywood uh, very successful in bringing the Chinese government's message uh, to brainwash the U United States people. And Western companies in China have a very bad record on human rights. Cisco helped the Chinese government to build a great firewall on top of the uh, internet to block Chinese people from accessing outside information. And the Yahoo gave their email contents to China. They said they had to follow the Chinese law. But unfortunately, quite a few reporters, Chinese reporters, they used the Yahoo email to discuss and say like how should they cover information about human rights in China. And this email exchange became evidence um, for the Chinese police and the Chinese courts to sentence these reporters to 80 years, 10 years in prison. And for decades, American business owners go to China uh, to do business. They have this fantasy that once we start to have business with the Communist Party and magically they will embrace freedom and democracy. And that magic unfortunately never happened because Chinese government used cheap labor and a sl a slave labor and Chinese people only got a little bit of benefit from this kind of trade. The Communist Party got most of the benefit. That was how they can have so much money. They can have so much resource they control the whole nation's resource, right? They can hire internet police, they can catch dissidents, they can have all these artificial intelligence to monitor every Chinese people, and they can come to buy United States, buy our media and the universities. While we have all these sad news about the Communist Party's infiltration into the US and the world, but, but in China, at their backyard, they're having big trouble. 
Because in China, after the Falun Gong was cracked down, the practitioners immediately went to public to appeal for their rights to meditate. So for about two or three years, every day people see hundreds and thousands of Falun Gong in almost every public area to protest for Falun Gong. And that scene lasting for three years changed the mindset of um, Chinese people. And nowadays there are thousands of different groups in China protesting every day. But the Falun Gong went underground in 2001. They started to print flyers and make DVDs at home and distribute them to the neighborhood to awake their fellow Chinese from propaganda. And in China, one can be sentenced to three years in prison for passing out a hundred flyers like that. But we are talking about millions of people in China risking their lives in the past 20 years to awake fellow Chinese. And also in the United States, Falun Gong practitioners formed three major software companies to write free software to help Chinese people to bypass Great Firewall on internet. And these softwares, they, nowadays they are helping about 30% of internet users in China to find out what's happening in the world and what's happening in China. And that started a great human rights movement in 2004. China started to have human rights lawyers Gao Zhishen used to be a top lawyer in China, and he decided to take his like one third of his time to take cases for human, for human rights. He openly defended the rights of Falun Gong, underground Christians, and other victim groups. And of course, he was immediately uh, uh, disappeared, quoted, disappeared. And you know, he's still, his whereabouts is still unknown. Uh, so we have been looking for him and as a member of Amnesty International. In Pasadena, he's our major case uh, of our action group. And, but his uh, courage inspired many, many lawyers in China. And nowadays, there are several thousand uh, famous human rights lawyers in China. You probably have read news about them from time to time. And Chinese people started to sign petitions to support victim groups. It was unbelievable. 30 years ago, when people sign petition and leave their fingerprints in red ink to show their identity, you can imagine the government can go after them immediately. But in 2000, uh, uh, 2015, I saw this petition signed by 50,000 people in China condemning the fourth organ harvesting. And I know that individual risk is much smaller now. And the most encouraging news from China is the trend of quitting the Communist Party because Communist Party pretty much runs like mafia. They always identify the successful people in the society, they recruit you to join. And if you say, I don't want to join, you will have trouble. And once you join the party, you will have to pay for the fee and you have to go to all the activities to persecute your fellow Chinese. And then you cannot quit the party from them. Otherwise you have trouble. So in 2004, volunteers in San Diego started a website. So that website allowed people to use VPNs to bypass the Great Firewall and post a statement uh, on this website to say, I want to quit the Communist Party. I want to quit the Youth League of the Communist Party. That's for high school students. Or I want to quit the Young Pioneer of the Communist Party. That's for middle schoolers and, and elementary students. So once they post this statement, they can get a digital certificate with a unique serial number about uh, quitting the Communist Party. And this digital certificate is accepted by the US government as an official document of, of quitting the party of China. Um, so when I became a China, US citizen in 2013, in the naturalization process, I had to answer uh, a standard question. Have you ever joined the Nazi ISIS or the Communist Party? If the answer were yes, I cannot be a US citizen, then I can submit this digital certificate with my serial number. And I said, I quit this party five years ago. And then the US government, the immigration office, accept this as an official document of quitting the Chinese Communist Party. And on the website, the current number says 410 million people quit the party and its affiliate organizations. And I would say that's the most encouraging news from China, and I hope that also encourage all of us in the United States um, to fight and to keep our freedom. And I want to end my talk here. I published most of my 
um, talk points with references on my blog, wenchenview.blogspot.com. And thank you very much for, to give me the opportunity to speak here. Well, Wen, thank you very much. And I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I, I, some fascinating stuff. And I've got several questions I'd like to ask. If anybody would uh, like to jump in also, let me know. Um, the first is, um, okay, so you work at Caltech. You work in the field of biology. Um, ha how difficult is it to unwind the intellectual property theft that goes on with business and the essential, the redesign of products and things that go on, the, the, the theft? You mean the intellectual property that, you know, what we have in the United States and how the Chinese government can obtain them? Yes. Yeah, that's a big topic of steal of intellectual property. So I think the biggest problem of those companies who want to sell their product in China, oftentimes the Chinese government asks them to submit to exchange the international or the, the patent with the market, right? If you want to enter Chinese market, you have to give them the you know, uh, the intellectual property. And then oftentimes the Chinese government will give this technology to the competitors in China. And after several years, the competitors will grow and then kick the original Western companies out of China. I think Yahoo is one example. And that's also one of the major reasons that Google had to leave China because of this. And at the same time, another way they do is that is reverse engineer. Once you get the product, many of them would do reverse engineer to copy it. And also uh, the Chinese government actively send uh, visiting scholars and students uh, as an exchange program to top research labs in the world. While they work in these labs, they would uh, steal this technology. Basically, they can take pictures and uh, send many things back to China. We have read in the news again and again how Chinese employees or Chinese visiting scholars, you know, uh, they copy the information, try to smuggle them back to China. That's also one way. And also on top of that, uh, the Chinese government have this uh, uh, Thousand talent program. So basically, they recruit the most talented scientists and engineers in the world. They would offer you a job in China, but they don't allow you to quit your job in your original country. So basically, for example, Charles Labor, uh, he's a department chair, chemistry department chair in Harvard University. So China offered him a job in a university in Wuhan. So basically, it's a very high paid job and uh, they give me him funding to set up a lab in this Wuhan University. And then basically he have to spend nine months in Harvard and uh, three months in Wuhan every year. And when he's in Wuhan, he can copy everything he did in Harvard in this Wuhan lab. So that is how Chinese government run these shadow labs to copy all the advanced technology to China. And these thousand talent program I think the number I saw like uh, last year was about, they already have like at least 80, like around 9,000 scientists in this thousand talent program. Of course, most of them, many of them are, are Chinese American, but they also have Westerners like Charles Labor. So that's also one way. And the last, the last thing they do is like their, like companies like Huawei, right? They offer fundings to universities all over the world, the top universities like MIT, like Stanford and Oxford University. They will say, oh, we have this big amount of money, like 300,000, um, no, $300 million per year. Huawei is offering $300 million per year. They call it like a research fund. So any research lab can apply for this fund, but you have to do the research uh, project offered by Huawei. So they can use the most brilliant minds in Stanford, in MIT, you know, to do Huawei's research to solve their technology problems. And unfortunately, many universities are very, very naive about this. They always say, oh, we want to stay away from politics. And they are not aware of this, um, the, the national security issue because, you know, all the training, all the research were funded by American uh, taxpayers, right? So you can't just, uh, you know, copy all of this to a foreign country's research lab and lose our research results to them. Other questions? Um, the thousand talents, and it's not just restricted to scientists, it's also people in finance and people in banking and uh, entrepreneurs of all kinds who are involved in that program. Um, the other thing, you're involved in an e-group, a e Rotary e-club now uh, regarding human trafficking. Talk about that for us. 
So this e-club started uh, at the International Rotary Conference in uh, Houston last year. So when we, people had this meeting in Houston, there was one victim from China. She was a Falun Gong practitioner. She was uh, arrested and detained uh, in China because of the practice. And she told her experience at the International Com Rotary International Conference uh, about uh, how the doctors took her blood type and about organ harvesting in China. And quite a few Rotary clubs were interested in, in establishing e-clubs, like focusing on organ harvesting. And that was how it started. Like eventually a group in uh, Kansas, Topeka, Kansas, started this e-club. And so the members were, the first uh, members were joined were those who participated in the Rotary International Conference in Houston, in Delaware, in Dallas. And then like I was, I learned about this e-club like a couple of months later and I, I became one of their members. And so like, so this particular e-club is under the umbrella of human trafficking, anti-human trafficking, because organ trafficking is a very important part of human trafficking, not just the sex trafficking, but also, you know, people kidnapped, got kidnapped for their organ. And China is the biggest problem here now because it's state sanctioned. And like they purposely arrested the Falun Gong and the Uyghurs and the young students, you know, and took their organs. So we, we want to raise awareness of this organ harvesting. So what do we do is that, you know, our members, e-club members are from all over the world. I'm from California, they are members from, you know, East Coast. So we, we usually do our local activities like for example, we can hold a film screens. I just uh, came back last month from K Topeka, you know, Kansas, after a film screen run by the Rotary Club. We have a 20 minute film about a medical genocide, about organ harvesting in China. And we have a panel, we answer the questions and we discussed what kind of, uh, you know, uh, actions we can take, especially, you know, at a state level, what, what, how we can advise our lawmakers to form laws to prevent Americans from participating in this kind of murder. For example, our patients should not go to China for transplant, right? And our hospitals and med medical centers should not teach Chinese doctors about how to do transplant because then we teach them how to kill people. So I think that's a very good e-club. And I'm very interested in knowing more about your Rotary District. Like when you have district meeting, maybe we can have do something similar, like, uh, you know, that film screen Kansas, like uh, a 20 minute film screen with panel discussion. I think that will be something very nice uh, for local people to get to know more about this issue. Well, you know, I was going to say, um, you, you uh, spoke at our Rotary Club 10 years ago, um, uh, and I didn't realize that. And I found you through the San Diego Speakers Bureau and asked you to come speak without realizing until I saw your photograph and then um, your bio, who we had you before, um, I would be very interested in exchanging emails to talk about having that film screening here within District 5300. Um, I'd really like to see that and talk to the Rotarians in Topeka who did that. Um, what kinds of, uh, last question, anybody else before I ask my final question, because we're kind of on time here. Okay, so my last question is, in, in, in China, how do you, how do you differentiate between business party government pla are are they all so together that if you're doing business in china you're probably doing business with the pla and not realizing it is is that is it that pervasive yes yes exactly i want to mention uh, china's national intelligence law uh, it was passed in 2017 basically it requires all entity in china any individual any company Whenever the Chinese government asks you for your data, like for your, like, you know, uh, you know, you have to submit it to the government because like they call it a national intelligence law. So like they would always use national security reasons, like, okay, this is a national security issue. You have to submit your data there. So for example, Huawei always claim it's a private company, like, you know, but according to China's national intelligence law, you have to submit you know, the data to them. So while we definitely will submit the data to the government, otherwise they break the law. It's the same thing like TikTok, right? TikTok, we have a big issue with it now. And they kept saying it's an American company, it's not a Chinese company. But the reality is that it's mother companies. ByteDance is a Chinese company. So according to Chinese law, TikTok will have to submit data to the Chinese police. And that's why we have such a big concern. 
So yes, China claims that it has many private companies, have individual companies, but because it's such a big surveillance company, uh, you know, everything is under the radar of the government. So even though like some individual, you may have your own personal business, but you know, it can be gone at any time. Just think about Jack Ma, right? Jack Ma, like he disappeared for several months. And like, you know, we, we Chinese, in our Chinese way, we call it raising a pig. You know, you feed a pig really well until it grows very big fat, and then it's time to slaughter them to harvest the meat. So, so that's why many Chinese people, wealthy Chinese people, will bring cash to San Marino to buy a house, right? Because that's the only place they keep the property. But in China, nobody feel anything's safe because the government can take away everything just ace up immediately in a blink of eyes. Well, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. It was very informative and uh, I certainly enjoyed your presentation. Continue with your work. I know you do that at some personal risk. Um, and I'm just hoping when we post this on YouTube, you don't get us banned. <laughs> no, 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 not a problem at all. <laughs> thank you so I've much. I've done this for 20 just years. <laughs> Yeah, we just won't put you up on TikTok. Thank you very much. No TikTok, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. So let's uh, continue here with the meeting. Our fine master is absent today. I think he's going to get hit with another fine for that. How about anybody else got fines for? Anybody had want to come forward and find themselves? Tell us what they've been doing. Give us some good news, some bad news. Give us a rant. Uh huh. I uh, I'll find myself um, ten dollars. My my usual annual uh, fine that uh, I am fine that uh, baseball season's about to start again. I got tickets to the April second game, uh, which is the Sunday day game, and I'm very excited to be back at Dodger Stadium. Excellent. Yes, and we we missed a year, and then we had a funky year, and so baseball is indeed. I've been listening to the games and and ready for opening day. Uh, anybody else with a fine for themselves? Yeah, Raymond. So I'd like to find myself $10 as well. Uh, I have been busy working on some things here uh, and haven't been able to be as free as I would like to. So uh, I would like to uh, extend that. Uh, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't cover everything and all the time that I've missed, but just want to let you guys know that, uh, you know, I'm here in spirit and I know we talk on the side sometimes. So I uh, wanted to also find myself as well. You know, uh, if you miss one more board meeting, you will be elected president. So uh, just so you know that, <laughs> that's like a rule around here. You miss three consecutive board meetings and they elect you president. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to see your face today. and glad to see you're you know, smiling back there. I know you're busy at uh, Chaparral, Vista, Vista Chaparral, um, and all the stuff you've got going on over there. Yeah, it's, it's great to see you, Sean. And uh, I will see you a week from tomorrow uh, at Strike for Success. Yes, yes. Just a, a quick question. Have we, have they talked at all about uh, reconciling the dates for the camp? Has anybody heard anything on? What I heard was, uh, was backdoor was they might be doing it in June. But okay. I, I think if they do it in June, the problem is school is out. Um, and it makes it much more difficult. So they may actually just scrub it. Um, I, sus I suspect that may also happen. Um, okay. I was going to give it till, um, well, honestly, they, if they don't tell us something by district assembly on the 22nd of April, uh, I assume it's been scrubbed for the, for this rotary year, because this rotary year is just about over. Thank God. Right. right. <laughs> um, right. That's all I've heard. And, but I did cancel uh, the Ryla, you know, they're supposed to come back. We have Pete's and they tell us about it. I, I obviously canceled that with Elba. There was the idea of having those kids come and, you know, kind of giving them a pre Ryla. Uh, I decided against that um, for a variety of reasons. One is we don't even know if Ryla is going to go off. So I don't want to have kids come and brief them about Ryla, give them pizza, get them excited. And then, oh, gosh, we're going to do it next year. And sorry, you're 18. You can't go. Right. So, um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Anything else? Any other fines there? Any other fines? Okay, so a couple things we got going on in Action 360. Riley's canceled. Foundation status. Um, wow, we have been on the phone with the IRS so much. It's not because we did anything wrong. It's because they're crazy. And, and we're getting it finally worked out like one tiny piece at a time. And I'm learning new things that did not know existed. Um, as an example, you can get a determination letter. But if you get a determination letter as a 501 
C3 public charity, and it's more than six months old, it's no good for a grantor. So then you have to get an affirmation letter that you're still a 501 from the IRS, and that takes 10 to 14. It's, a, it's like a giant Charlie Foxtrot. Uh, 2026 committee um, is meeting at the end of April, April 18th. That is the committee to plan the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence here in San Dimas. Uh, they asked our club about uh, hosting a, a casino night. I spoke to the casino night people. I have an email out to the city about the city providing the location. Um, and um, it sounds like a really good thing. And as soon as I get some information back, we'll pick two or three dates. I'll check it with the committee and that'll have a lot of different groups involved. So the casino night uh, should be a really good fundraiser and get some bank. And the, the San Dimas Rotary Foundation is acting as the bank for that. Uh, the next thing I have up is a satellite Rotary Club meeting. Uh, they have meetings scheduled, their speakers, all the way through August. I don't know if you guys have been, but they have like top quality speakers as we've been having also. Lastly, the fashion show. Uh, Diva's not here today. Um, we're supposed to have a committee meeting soon. Um, we're right. We're on the wire on this thing. We've got to push it forward or push it back. And so I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, before I go over the calendar, anybody got anything they want to talk about? Uh, just the next satellite Rotary Club is that tonight or is that next week? That is next, uh, actually not till April fifth. Okay, um, good because I couldn't make it tonight. So. <laughs> yeah. So um, the next thing we have on the calendar is Strike for Success on the thirtieth, uh, and then we are dark, and that was supposed to be our Ryla speakers, but their next meeting is uh, the California State Commanders Veteran Council, and also then on the eleventh we are hosting. Uh, a chamber coffee hour at Via Verde Dental. So this is a rotary coffee hour, 1030 or 830 in the morning. Um, we have, then you see the speakers we have coming up, uh, everything from Think Outside the Box, um, uh, the World War II Museum, on and on and on. And I'm already, we have all our meetings through the year are done. And we now have probably into August for us. And Steve and I have already completed his calendar for his year. Last thing I want to say is kickout party and installation is going to be, uh, let me pull that back up again. You get the right date. It's going to be at, it's going to be June 21st, 6 p.m. at Sendejas. So we can have an actual meal rather than, the brewery is a great place, but the brewery doesn't serve food. Um, and so uh, it'll be Sendejas, 6 p.m. Put that on your calendar, please. Um, you know, that'll be installing Steve and kicking me out. And so I'd like everybody to be there. June 21st? Yes. 6 p.m. Yeah. 6 p.m. on the 21st of June, uh, we will be meeting. And we will have our quarterly assembly kickout party and installation at uh, Zendejas. And that is on a Wednesday evening um, at 6 p.m. Is that going to take the place of the Wednesday meeting? Yes, there'll be no meeting on that date. Yes, absolutely. Anything else? All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here this evening, and I will see you. Hey, see you at Strike for Success. Very, I'll be there. I'll stop by also. I know Mike will stop by with the foundation card and pay for the bowling, but um, it's going to be uh, a great deal. Oh, last thing. Mary Ann and I did go out to uh, Rancho Mirage on Monday and attended the YMCA's 30th anniversary celebration. At that meeting, I was able to meet the chief of staff of the base, uh, the colonel, who I, he's fast-tracked to be a general officer, so it's a great contact. Also, we met with uh, William French, a vice admiral, who is the uh, president of the YMCA nationally and the executive director of the Camp Pendleton YMCA, who heads a food pantry there, and she's going to be a speaker at the Satellite Rotary Club in August. That's already been arranged. Facebook events up. We did that like yesterday. But the last thing I want to tell you about, the colonel got up and spoke and he said his biggest problem at 29 Palms is the fact that he has 4,500 teenagers there. And let me tell you what those 4,500 teenagers are. 1,500 of them are dependents. 3,000 of them are Marines. And uh, Marianne and I sat at a table. Marianne's laughing. Our table, they were, they were 18 and 19 years old. It's a big school up there. They got all these schools. And, and you're going to know what I'm talking about, Sean. They're going to school up there. They land after boot camp, and they put them into a, what you'd call a holding company. They've got 500 Marines in a holding battalion. That means they've got nothing to do except polish their shoes and do PT. 
So I've already got a call out to, um, I've already made this arrangement. I'm going to talk, we're going to have a Zoom call with Patrick, the Masonic Lodge in 29 Palms, um, the Grand Master of Masons next year, who's a retired Lieutenant Colonel from Marine Corps. And we're going to sponsor game nights at the Masonic Lodge. And there'll be video game tournaments and where we'll have refreshments and snacks. That's one of the things I'll bring to you for funding. Um, and then we'll provide transportation. It's about a mile away from the base to give teenagers a place to go on a weeknight that that's not doesn't have alcohol, doesn't have pornography, doesn't have sex, violence. It's just to play well in the video games these days. They've got all of that. But um, a place where they, and I think, Sean, you're working with the same group of kids, except they're not in the Marine Corps. So you can see what we're trying to do here. Well, and, and I will tell you, you know, you as well as as being in uh, the service, that kind of uh, uh, limbo or, or in between point of being assigned uh, school or going out into your MOS and job, you know, you're, you're kind of just laid over. And um, sometimes that's some of the hardest things to to face because you don't have the opportunity to talk to family necessarily. They've got you doing busy work all day. And there's nothing to move or push you to to go forward because you don't know what the next phase is. And I think that's a great opportunity uh, for Marines and, and teenagers that, that are there with families to give them an outlet to be able to do something. Uh, yes. It's something to look forward to on on top of a busy day. And you know what? Uh, it, it does more than just brighten uh, someone's day. It actually builds community. So I think it's a great opportunity. So we're going to talk to the Rotary Club there in 29 Palms and get them involved. But the thing is, Mary and I had a very successful, uh, we went to the luncheon for the purpose of making connections. And we made some really great connections out there um, in Rancho Mirage and had a great meal, quite frankly. They did a good job. So uh, that's all I want to report on that. Anybody have anything before we go? Thank you so much, guys. I will see you all when I see you again.